Queridos amigos, ¿qué les pareció la entrevista pasada? Por favor, comenten, pregunten. Me encanta este tema, para mí es, como ya se dieron cuenta, fundamental. Y creo que a todos debería interesarnos sobremanera porque la vida de las demás criaturas con las cuales coexistimos es una parte fundamental de la nuestra también. Y vamos a continuar con esta maravillosa entrevista con estos dos grandes héroes de nuestro planeta. En la entrevista pasada nos platicaron qué los mueve, qué los llevó a dedicar su vida entera, a entregarse en cuerpo y alma a hacer lo que hacen. Y en esta entrevista les tenemos otras sorpresas preparadas muy interesantes también. Vamos a escucharlos. Espero que la disfruten. Este es el videoblog de Eduardo Oseguera por el YouTube channel de Fuerza Integral. So you guys have worked in so many uh, super important organizations around the world, very serious, very renowned, very trustworthy. What makes Panthera different to all of them? What, what would you say, uh, why are you in Panthera right now and not any other, any other place? What makes Panthera different for me is that the nature conservation uh, field as becoming now extremely professional. People are taught, they get their diploma, they are trained in various aspects of nature conservation. And many organizations have moved to strategic planning, needed to do what needs to be done in various aspects of nature conservation. But they moved away from this connection with nature, which is the emotional connection that we have, and knowing the species you are actually dealing with. Many organizations now are working on driver of extinction, on global issues, climate change, uh, deforestation, trade, uh, policies, and so on and so forth. And because they become very specialized, they are, to some extent, also part of the disconnection of this organization with what we are actually trying to preserve. And for me, when the choice was made to, am I interested to join Pantera, the, the key things was that knowing that within this organization, half of the program people, or even more than half, were actually biologists. They could tell me what a tiger needs, how a tiger behaves, how a jaguar, a puma, a small cat, a cheetah, a lion. And that's very, very unique. The other thing that makes Pantera unique is that we are based and rooted in science. We need to understand what we want to conserve, and not only superficially. A lion is a lion everywhere, but a lion is facing threat and issues which are very different if you talk to a lion in Botswana than it uh, talks a lion in um, West Africa. Same thing for Jaguar. Yeah. Knowing this intimately what a Jaguar is, but how it will behave in different rel relation to different contexts is very, very important. And Pantera is one of the only organizations now who still have this body of knowledge intellectual knowledge which allow us to define conservation strategy which are at the same time rooted in science but extremely pragmatic and we can always link one to the other because we know and we don't rely on anyone else to actually understand uh, what big cats or small cats need and that's very very specific it's not common most of the large organizations have moved away from that you hardly find a tiger specialist in most of the organization we are dealing with or interacting with, or a jaguar specialist for that. Pantera has that. Most of the people we have are the top specialists in their fear, in, in their field. In the field with, with the animals and with the communities and, and the understanding community. their political and social and... and that's uh, it. So we are able to merge that. But we are always able to bring it back to the fundamental basic biology of the species we are dealing with. That's great. That's great. The great answer, Fred. Thank you so much. 
you want to add anything to that, Howard? No, I think uh, Fred described it perfectly. I, I mean, I, uh, it is, uh, I've been with Panthera for 10 years, and the reason I stay and the reason I, I came to Panthera was this base, this, that this was a group of experts that were allowed to understand their animal first and then build from that science to build the conservation structure that we have. And hopefully we'll continue to, to grow under Fred's leadership because there's so much to do. So <laughs> we are going to grow, I know, and there's so much to do. And um, Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's a unique organization. It really is. It yeah. truly is. I, I really feel fortunate to be part of it. So. Yeah. And, and this organization also... And, and that's some, certainly something I want to reemphasize, and I, I keep saying, never feel the need to justify why it was working on cats, conservation. Uh, we don't feel the need. When I say to the team when I come, I don't want us to spend months and years to prioritize which species we work on based on a number of very rational strategic decision based on the contribution of the species to human welfare or so and so. We made the choice that we are the organization dedicated to cat conservation. We don't need to go further, but we should be the organization that work on all cat species, the big one and the small cats uh, alike. And I don't want us to spend more time to say that. People keep asking them, why do you want to conserve cats? What is it that they bring? I mean, we made the choice, the organization made the choice years uh, ago, and that's something I want to re-emphasize. We will stay working on cats, um, all cats. The first week or so that I was appointed in Pantera, I met the chief strategist of another organization, which is fairly well known in, in nature conservation. And they know my background. My background is not a cat biologist. I work in government. I work on any environmental issue from nuclear power, infrastructure, fisheries, protected area, and you, you name it. So they knew my very wide uh, interest and contribution. And the first thing that person told me was, so now Fred, that you are in head of Pantera, how long will Pantera still be working on cats? Because you need now to work on driver of extinction or of big global issues on, on things like that. And he told me that within his own organization, within the next two or three years, he will foresee that there won't be a single biologist in the organization. Wow. But they will have commodity specialists, water specialists, tariff people, people who are able to look at ecosystem servicing and strategy, conservation finances, all these big things. Mm -hmm. And I really fought back and say, well, that's not what we are and that's not what we want. If anything, we will root Pantera even more in species conservation right. because that is something we, we need. It's not diminishing the importance of all these global issues, far from that. But we have no time for this big issue to be addressed. And if you don't keep a level of understanding knowledge on the ground on the species, we run the, fa the, the, the issue that, yeah, we might solve climate change issue in the next 50 years, but you won't have a single polar bear left by then. You need to have people dedicated to preserving, conserving what is there now. And for us, it, it's a time issue. We have five years for some of the species, not 50 years. When we talk of tigers, we are not talking of population anymore. We are talking about individual. 3,000 plus tiger, wild tiger in the world. Most of the people think that they are still a lot, yeah. but we need to be on the front line. We need to be on the field because one tiger loss is a huge loss for the population. We are impairing the capacity of the species as a species to actually rebound once, hopefully when we sort out the, the main contextual big driver. So for us, it's really 
be there on the ground, in the front line, and every individual counts. So we, we are, what we are doing is not saving the species. Species can do that on their own. We are just gaining time and hopefully preserving them for long enough that they can rebound on, on, on their own. So we are basically the, the guardians of, of some of the species. Not us alone, but with a lot yes, of people. Without, without our help, those species would not be able to, to get to that rebound because... Exactly, because they are not enough. Yes. They are very small numbers. I mean, in some species, I mean, jaguar, for example, we are more on tens of thousands of individuals, yes. so we have a little bit more time, a yes. little bit more option. For, for tigers, we are down to... Yeah, the three, four thousand, which yeah. is a very small number. If you take lion in West Africa, it's probably even less than three hundred. Yeah, that's uh, crazy. And a lot of species on small cats, for example, we actually know nothing. Yeah. People have the feeling that we know everything about everywhere. Every cat, yeah. There are a number of species that have never been photographed. Yes. We have no visual record of them. We don't know where they are even less uh, how many they are. And we're talking about wild cats, right? And we are talking about wild cats. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, tiger we know, lion we know, yes. cheetah we know, but who know in detail about the margay, the yeah. flat-headed cat, the fishing cats, yeah. all these species that are very difficult to see, we are just starting yes. there. So we need to let them time. And yeah. that's all we do. This is time, pushing the boundary, another five years, another 10 years. Yes. And when I say that, when I talk to decision makers and things, we aren't talking about 100 years. Yeah. We are really talking for some species, five to 10 years horizon. Yes. That's old. Yes, uh, a lot of people think that it's an exaggeration, but it, that's really the situation, right? Like, now, big cats around the world are in a very critical situation and and we have the fortune as as uh, inhabitants of the american continent to have uh, the the species that is doing the best right now which is the jaguar mm -hmm. uh, the jaguar is endangered in mexico but it, it, we have large populations of jaguars uh, along the the corridor that goes from mexico to argentina but how how endangered is the species what are the main challenges that that specific species is facing right now. Yeah, well, uh, it, you're right. We're lucky that we've got a species that we've got fair numbers on. Uh, if you take the two, uh, the two most recent estimates for range-wide numbers, you'd, and you take the average, it'd be about 100,000 individuals in the wild. But as Fred is pointing out, um, the you know species die by a thousand cuts, and that's what's happening right now with jaguars. That is, what is key to jaguar survival outside of the Amazon basin is connectivity. We now have something like 29 core populations and on top of that uh, is somewhere around 40 really critical corridors between those, those uh, core populations. So every one of those corridors is threatened by human development. So our Really, our goal right now, number one, is to make sure that that connectivity continues into the future. Otherwise, um, this five-year horizon, we could, we could see probably the sealing the death of at least half of those core populations if we don't maintain that connectivity in the next five years. Because as soon as you isolate populations, this is one of the, one of the basics of, of uh, of evolution and extinction is connectivity and core numbers of individuals. And with jaguars, um, there's a very good possibility if we don't act now, that we will isolate those populations. And once you isolate those populations, you essentially seal their doom within the next 100 to 200 years. Why is that? Because of genetic um, variation. If you have a big park and you have many jaguars, mm -hmm. but no connectivity with other genetic pools, what happens? That's right. If you, if you, for instance, isolated the population of jaguars in northern Sonora in Mexico, 
guaranteed, all the models and in fact reality will show you, those Jaguars will be gone in under 200 years. That it's, it's essentially guaranteed because of genetic isolation. So our, our role is to make sure that that population is connected to other populations. Um, and that's what we work on up and down the Jaguar corridor from Arizona to Argentina. And part of that is protecting those core populations. And now we're trying to, within those core populations, get the protection they need. Uh, many of these parks are paper parks, There's, everybody agrees. And now, through community development, through um, citizen science, through additional training of guards, those core populations, we hope we're, we're securing those. Then it's that lifeblood that, that the corridor uh, that provides for survival that's so important. And that's where conflict with humans is so important. And in Latin America, Probably number one on a day-to-day -day basis is retaliatory killing of jaguars due to conflict primarily with livestock uh, growers. Um, and the, the, the reality is, and that again, the good news is that we have solutions. We now have almost a dozen solutions to livestock predation by jaguars and pumas. Um, now it's just basically a matter of trying to take that to scale and make sure that that livestock grower who's in that critical corridor between this core population and that core population has the tools. And, and it, believe me, the people that we, we, we've rarely come across, people who say, yeah, I just want to kill them. They don't. What we find is, please give me the solution because I really, really don't want to have to kill this jaguar. They want that jaguar in their backyard because it enhances them, enhances their their potential to even develop ecotourism, um, but many of them understand that it enhances uh, the human condition to have those species there. Um, so the really our, our biggest goal right now is to take those solutions and move them as rapidly as we can within this five to 10 year horizon, and I think we'll be able to secure jaguars. At, at, uh, a century ago, there were an estimated 100,000 tigers in the wild. Um, a that's, century ago. Yeah. yeah that's, that's my my father and my mother's age. Almost, yeah, almost, there you go. Almost, a, they are 90. A century, so. yeah, within a lifetime. A, a, within a, a lifetime, yes. Currently extended human lifetime. Um, and that's where we are with jaguars. There were as many tigers as now there are jaguars. Yeah, that's right, exactly. And now, and there's now only as Fred tigers. says, there's, yeah, 3,800 are in the wild, estimated mm -hmm. in the wild. We've got to make sure that jaguars don't become another tiger. And, yes. and especially when you look up and down uh, Latin America and tiger, ra uh, tiger range, jaguar range, and you see the connection there is between jaguars and human society, from the Olmecs uh, to the Incas to the Mayas, there's really a tie there. And, and just driving in Mexico City or San Jose, Costa Rica or Sao Paulo, Brazil, you see the images of jaguars everywhere. But often people, as we've already talked about here today, uh, people don't understand that, oh, there is a problem. And we've got to be able to educate people for that and understand that it is part of the culture and part of something that is a natural heritage that, that's, that's part of us. It's, it's part of really our part of us. Yes. Yeah. So, so the, the main threat to these biological corridors is human development. So Panthera is about stopping development, is about stopping human development? Absolutely not. Uh, in fact, we are, we're, we're more about compatibility with development, whether it's road building or we're not trying to stop roads or dams or power lines or, or cattle ranchers. We want it to be smart development. Uh, um, we know that we can go into a large ranch or a small ranch and we can look at it and say, here's, here's your prescription. We'll help you put this together. Uh, we have the solutions. We're not trying to stop any of that development. Uh, there are you know, certain types of development, I suppose, we'd like to see minimized or compartmentalized. Uh, mining is a very difficult one in some places, but we have found, we now have 
three different studies that would indicate that if you control world building, if you control the, the impact that the miners have on that forest, you can actually maintain that area in almost the same condition it was before. Because really in most mining, it's, it's, it's a very well-defined footprint. You just need to limit the impacts of that footprint. Uh, that's an extreme example, but for places, for, for cattle ranching, which right now is a huge focus of ours, um, the answers are there. The, we really do have solutions. Uh, so it's not about stopping uh, human advancement, it's about making sure it's a little bit smarter. And, so. and, and some of these changes, for example, in, in Jaguar Range, cattle ranching is probably one of the best human land habitat which is, if managed properly along the line that uh, Howard is mentioning, allow both the activities, the cattle ranching, but also the existence of Jaguar. Replace a cattle ranch landscape in South America by palm oil plantation <laughs> or uh, corn or this type of habitat. This is far worse for, for, for the Jaguar. So it's really looking at the type of human activities or landscape because there are very few landscape on Earth which are not man-made or haven't been really affected by, by man. And to find this compromise and this solution to, to live together. So certainly Pantera is not up to transforming cattle ranching landscape to something else which would actually will be much more detrimental for, for, for the Jaguar. The same apply in, in some of the landscape in, in Africa or, or in Asia. So it's really finding compromise. But again, this compromise can only be found if we are pragmatic and we know what we are doing there. And we need to be credible also with the rancher we engage with. We need to show that we understand also their issues, their uh, hardship, their constraints and their challenges, so that we don't come up with completely an alien perspective or, or with logic that they can't really acknowledge with. If you have a, a dialogue, you need to be able to show that first you have the capacity to listen to the person you want to engage and to understand and know what this uh, person is going through. And then we bring what the Jaguar is going through and its challenge and things. They can't talk by themselves. We have to talk on behalf of the Jaguar. Uh, but it, it is a dialogue. Uh, and that this dialogue is only relevant if people is confident that actually the people they are talking to understand and uh, what, what they have to say. And there is where each time we do that, we, 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 most of the time we find common solution there. Uh, but it is a repetitive process. It takes time. Uh, Another big challenge is uh, part of the situation tigers are at now is the Chinese uh, demand for, for tiger parts, for the traditional Chinese medicine and, and this belief that if they take parts of this powerful animal, those powers will be theirs. And that's a big part of why tigers are in such a critical situation right now. And the Chinese black market is starting to look at jaguars as the substitute for tigers now, and, and this is a huge, huge threat. Am I right? Yes. I mean, it is, but I want to say something there. I mean, this idea of a traditional ch Chinese medicine is a at least for me, is, is a non-starter. Mm -hmm. There is absolutely nothing traditional in the way now Chinese or other people are exploiting wildlife. There's never been traditional in any Chinese culture to use fang or claws of jaguar as pendant. There is nothing traditionally using bones of lions or tiger in, in medicine. These are more uh, market driven and uh, I would say more status driven. 
the traditional, the, the traditional aspect is on a very few species. Traditionally, tra uh, Chinese medicine never used pangolin scale as part of their concoction or, or things. Now it's become one of the main threat. One of the big threats, for example, now on Asian elephant is this blood bead that people are wearing around their neck. And that's something totally new. Two years ago, nobody have heard about that. But now you have elephants which are targeted, skin, and they take the little bit of skin which has blood vessel in that and put it into beads yeah. that people are wearing. Mm. Nothing traditional there. So we need to not fall into the trap that because it's traditional, then people have a right yeah. to actually continue this tradition. They have the right of their tradition up to a point where this does not impair the survival of a species. Of it does not impair also the fact that all the population, all the society did see this animal from a different eyes. When Chinese people are coming to Jaguar range to take off Chinese uh, uh, Jaguar part because it's part of their traditional culture, it is not part of the traditional culture of South American society. How do you fight that? How, how can... I think there, it's, you, you fight it not from... I mean, you have a number of awareness uh, work that needs to be done. More, I would say, let's talk about in South America, more about the tradition, the, the, the society here, to say that you are being ripped off. You are being taken for granted, people are spoiling your, 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 your national identity, your identity. So that's not acceptable. We also need to deal with it as what it is. Some fringe of the population, and we don't need the entire China to uh, advocate for Chinese medicine. We are very often dealing with a few individuals. Yes. It's not a mass market. It is a few individuals who are creating that. And you, you deal with it as what it is, a crime. And you target individual, and you target network, and you target uh, activities which are illegal in nature and are, are criminal in nature. Uh, I've got a first-hand experience of something in the, uh, from my private life in in the Middle East where suddenly people realize that a lot of cheetah were actually taken from Africa and traded to the Middle East. And the traditional approach, that it, the Middle East or the country there are creating a market for, for cheetah. So we apply the traditional, the international community apply the traditional ways of looking at that, looking at trade, looking at awareness, looking at making provision to uh, restrict this trade and all this, but address that as nearly a country is thriving from for cheetah. Being inside, we, know very, we knew very well that the entire business was started with interest from two people, hmm. only two people. Who were actually benefiting. Which were actually wealthy individuals, but they were convinced that it will be fantastic for their status or whatever you call it uh, to reinstate the tradition of hunting gazelle or hare with cheetah. So they, needed, they wanted cheetah. And to train them, you need young one. So they put a price tag on it and they got a few. And because they are wealthy, completely disconnected, the price tag they gave is tremendous for the people who can provide that. Mm. So the overall trade started with that. And then it became free willing. People heard that somebody, a prince, wanted cheetah, paid a lot of money. Well, so maybe I can get some also. Mm. And then I can find new clients and so on and so forth. So the, the answer we do need, again, to be targeted to the problem. And for that, we need to know exactly what is the problem. But some of these uh, trade issues are, yeah, they are criminal network. And were you, were you able to stop that? 
we, we, we stop it from, but in the traditional way. Once we knew where it's coming from, we had the father or the elder of the tribe talking to the younger one and say, you have to stop. You are putting bad name on our tribe, on our, on our family name of our country. You are shaming us. This is not how I raise you. Fascinating. You have to stop that. But this is not something you are going to put in the newspaper. This is not something you will debate in an international convention and all these kind of things. If you do that, people start to, where now I am attacked in my, my family, my, my nation, nation, they fight back. And you actually not solve the problem. So that aspect was solved, but it takes five, 10 years for all the chain of supply to know that there is no demand anymore. So stop capturing uh, young cheetah in, in East Africa. Stop sending them because nobody is buying them. There is no market. But it's still, uh, no, we, we still live with that on five, 10 years after. But uh, yeah, we can solve that. So you, you have many successful programs that were Wildcats have not only stabilized as a population, but also thrived. Uh, can you mention some of, some of them? Yeah, I mean, I will leave Howard on the, on the Jaguar because he knows <laughs> best and things, and on Puma. But certainly, in all the place we've been working on Tiger, with our strategy, which is called Tiger Forever, which is basically taking and selecting sites where we have depleted population, but a high potential of recovery if we do the right thing. And mostly in Tiger Range is conflict resolution and a better law enforcement. We've seen Tiger number increasing. So we create basically safe zone. And as I say, this population of cats or most of the wild animals are actually fairly resilient. As, lo as soon as you lessen the pressure, they recover yeah. there. They recover at the speed that their biology allows them to recover. So some are slow breeding, some are faster breeding, but tiger are, are resilient and uh, give them the space, give them the time, give them the, the safety, and they will find a way out. So we have in all our site documented increase from 20, 20 through Tiger to 30, 35 in one site, but in five years. So, which is quite, quite fast there. So we know that it is working and it's not rocket science. It's, you have a protected area, equipped, provide the right resources to the people in the, in the front line and enforce the law. Don't invent new law, just in for the one you already have. Control uh, poaching, remove the snare, remove the incentive for the local population to, to, uh, to, to snare the, the, those animals. And, all, and also deal with the criminal network who are operating in those landscapes. So we have a lot of activity on, on crime, wildlife crime, intelligence gathering, and all these kind of things. And on Jaguar and Puma range, yes, we have also. Yeah, no, there's, uh, at least within Jaguar range, there's a couple dozen very good examples of, um, you know, a as scientists, we, we like to get the numbers and monitor them. And luckily, we've now developed a very effective um, camera trap. And we work with a species that has spots that essentially are like fingerprints, so we can identify individuals. So we have very good data on um, the stability of populations where we have implemented these kinds of uh, conservation actions. And so I, I hope we, we, we do this interview two years from now. Um, I hope we have hundreds of examples like yes. that. <laughs> and I think we many will. Many of them in Mexico. And many of them in Mexico. Um, uh, right now, I think the best example is uh, uh, the Pantanal, where we went we, we found a place where there were jaguars, one of the highest densities, but they were being killed constantly. I mean, we, we literally heard of scores of jaguars within 
uh, a year or two that were being killed as retaliatory killing. But uh, we took control of a ranch or two in the area. We then talked to the other ranchers. They stopped the hunting of, of jaguars um, and a couple of other things like uh, no ranch dogs and things. Suddenly, um, jaguars were visible and we thus was developed ecotourism for jaguars. And we were able to show the ranchers how to use these anti-predation techniques. So in that particular situation, we've seen uh, not only did ranchers not have to kill them just because they were killing their, their cattle, and we solved that, but there was now a positive value on that jaguar. Um, and thus, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's one of those models I hope we can, we can duplicate over and over and over in uh, places like Mexico and every place in Jaguar Range. Absolutely. Pues muy bien, otra dosis de realidad trascendente e importante, pero es mucho lo que podemos hacer y este es el momento de hacerlo, ya hablaremos de eso más adelante, pero no se pierdan muy pronto la tercera y última parte de esta maravillosa entrevista que estos grandes hombres tuvieron la generosidad de compartir con nosotros. Bendiciones y hasta pronto. Muchas gracias. Este es el videoblog de Eduardo Oseguera por el YouTube channel de Fuerza Integral.